But I want to share with you a few thoughts out of the theme called the story of Johnny Boy. The story of Johnny Boy. If you were here first service, I feel sorry for you because many of you asked me to repeat the same message a second service, which is tough because I don't remember what I say. I mean, you know, I just kind of make up stuff when I go. So anyway, uh, the story of Johnny Boy, we're going to read out of uh, Acts, Acts chapter 12. We're going to read chapter 12, verse 12, one verse in New Living Translation, and it goes like this. Uh, um, when he, Peter, so quickly, 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 Peter, Peter was supposed to, Peter the apostle, Peter was supposed to be murdered, killed in the morning by Herod the king. His friend James was beheaded earlier, okay? And so Peter was supposed to be killed that morning because Herod king decided in the first century that Peter was too influential, a religious leader, and so he wanted to kill him. And so, but the night before he was killed, the angel showed up in the prison and just knocked out two uh, guards and everybody else, all the guards around and took Peter out of prison. And when he took him out in the middle of the night, Peter just, watch this, Peter realized that he's out and this is not a dream, not a vision. This is not something he's just kind of envisioning or, you know, in his dreams. This is reality. So he went to the home of Mary. Everybody say Mary, mother of John. Mary, mother of John. Listen, every Johnny here, uh, by symbol I'm speaking, not just a couple of Johnny and Jonathans that are here, but every boy, listen, you are as good as your mama. So mama was great. I didn't say daddy, mama. I have to say that because, I mean, Johnny's mama is really powerful. So uh, home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. Everybody say John Mark. Okay, where many were gathered for prayer. If you know anything, if you study history, a background, geography, whatever you study, etymology, uh, social aspect of the first century, this was an influential house. If you know out of history that uh, Mary, Mary was actually married to a man from a Greek province. He was rich, pretty rich, and but uh, um, she was basically also from one of the Greek island from uh, Cyprus. And anybody visited Cyprus? I know many of you went to Greek because it looks good. All the white, beautiful buildings and all these. It looks good for the pictures. And not that it's like, uh, you know, you can have the same Greek food here. But anyway. But how many of you, nobody went to Cyprus? Awesome. I'm with you. I didn't either. But anyway. And so um, they came and they were in Jerusalem. They bought a beautiful house in the middle of downtown. It was nice. Okay. But they were very influential. She was Jew, uh, Jewish and he was Greek, the father. So they had a little boy named John. John, Hebrew word, Ioannis. Uh, and uh, uh, he was growing up in this house. And uh, many historians believe that he was named after John the Baptist. John the Baptist was very influential. Remember, it was angel that told the mother of John the Baptist to name John the Baptist baby John. And so some believe that it, it became a very popular name in the first century in a, in a Jewish culture. But as he was growing up, Obviously, the Greek language was taking over, and it was very sophisticated. Uh, the world became smaller. It's like our time, the, you know, the, the, the expansion of the internet, the, the, the websites, uh, you know, the picture and, 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 and videos, and, and it's almost like the world is smaller. Like you could be here, and a few hours later, you're a different country, and a few hours extra, you're a different continent, and it's like the world is small, and that's what it felt like that time, first century, because the Greek culture was taking over the philosophy, the art, you know, anything from Greece was so popular. So they also gave the little boy, Johnny, became also Mark, Marcus, Ioannis Marcus. So he had a Jewish name, John, Ioannis, uh, you know, John in English, Ioannis in, 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 Jew, in Jewish language, in Hebrew. And, but he was also Marcus as he was growing up. But there was something profound in that house that was happening. And that was that because the house was huge and it was in Jerusalem, um, uh, uh, what was happening actually is that disciples and all the believers were gathering in this house beautiful house big house can i just say this that i've said it many times but i'm going to say one more time is there is nothing wrong with having nice house nice car nice things everything is wrong when those nice things have you okay in fact god will entrust you many times nice things if you are a good steward of those nice things are you with me if you own things rather than things owning you you're okay if you own it and share it with other people, God will multiply it. God is a multiplier. In fact, God is all about, he's going to give you one talent. If you're a good steward, he's going to give you more talents. It's just the way he is. And in fact, talent was the measure of money. It's just the way he is. Matthew 25, 
okay, is just who God is. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. Mary and her husband were that kind of people. They said, our house. They said, mi casa, su casa. Okay, they were like, my house is your house. Come on. By the way, if you're watching online, welcome. We love you. A few people texted me watching from different country. Freddie, thank you for watching us from Portugal. He said to say hi to everybody. He loves us. And I had to say that because, you know, otherwise he would, not, he would stop watching us. No, I'm joking. And so uh, he did, actually. And so, um, you know, he, they were nice people, but they were giving to disciples. But with that, with, with being generous and being kind to all the people around them, especially to believers, what was happening is Mary was smart because she realized that little Johnny, Johnny who was very skillful and, and a smart kid, they invest a lot of money into his education. But they said, you know what, education is important, but not the most important piece or ingredient in the life of a child. Uh, the society, the community you're, you're, you're surrounded with is important, but not, not as important as the presence of God. The best place to raise your kids is not a location. It's an ingredient. It's called presence of God. The best way to raise your kids it's not a method. It's an ingredient. It's called presence of God. You are foolish as a parent if you take your kids away from the gathering of believers. You're foolish. Sorry for being honest. <laughs> we have four kids. And the best thing we could do for them is to make sure they grow up in the presence of God. It's very important. And it's not just the church. It's about the word. It's about the prayer. It's about talking, talking, discussing, instilling the values of the heart of God into their life. And so Mary was smart because she said, you know what, whatever it will cost us, we might have to change a carpet, uh, hardwood floors a few times, tile in a, in, a, in a kitchen or whatever that is, you know, quartz these days or, you know, granite or whatever that is. But you, you know what, who cares? Let's get all the believers into our house. So disciples, people, believers were gathering in their house and that became so profound and shaping the mind of little Johnny. Johnny was educated, but he was also in the presence of God. Johnny was a popular kid. Johnny was respected among his peers, but the most important ingredient of his life was that he was surrounded by this, as the author of Hebrews says, the cloud, the multitude of witnesses, witnesses that talked about Jesus. So little Johnny was so excited about hearing all the things that God was doing through disciples, the Jesus, the reality of Christ, the power that Jesus demonstrated. He was listening to the stories in his house, and it was mind-blowing, changing his mind, changing his heart. This little boy, I mean, just imagine this story. Peter shows up in the middle of the night. Believers are praying in the house. This is a, this is a story, okay? And Johnny's up. This is like way past midnight. Okay, and he is not hidden somewhere on the internet watching stuff. He's just like listening to testimonies. It's like amazing. Okay, and so Peter shows up and they're like, dude, you were in prison. You were supposed to be killed in the morning. James, the apostle, your friend was just killed a few days ago. You were supposed, what happened? And Peter is like, uh, angels? True story. So he's watching, witnessing all of it. And what happened with little Johnny is... One day, let's go to chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. One day, one day, he's going, he's following disciples, leaders. So he goes to another city close by called Antioch. Antioch was a phenomenal church. In fact, it, it was the city. In that city, there was a church. And it was the city and a church that people, the believers for the first time, called themselves Christians. Which meant like Jesus. Think about it. For the first time, they were always known Jews. They were always known as God, you know, believers and uh, one God and all these names that they, that, they, that they were labeled by other people, other nations. But suddenly these people that follow Jesus, they said, no, we're Christians, we're Christ-like. So in this church in Antioch, the Bible says, as among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon called the black man, Lucius, from Cyrene, Menaean, okay, the child companion of King Herod, and Saul. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord, they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. Watch how the Spirit of God, listen to this, the Spirit of God gives them a work, 
Everybody look at me. Sometimes you are thinking, you are guessing, you are puzzled, you are questioning, you are in search of your calling. And you think your calling should be in the shape of a title. But God says, why are you looking for a title when I have a job for you? Sometimes you have to start with a job before you get a title. Sometimes you grow into your title. Sometimes the title is more evident, more distinct, sharper as you are doing the work God has given. And, and it's, it just takes one step of obedience. Just one step. If the Lord is asking you, whatever a small thing that is, maybe, maybe being generous, maybe just embracing, maybe just talking to someone, maybe just giving something from you, maybe just being there for someone, maybe just going place that the Lord has told you. Just one step, it's called obedience. In fact, the fastest way you go from one step on a ladder to another. It's not information. It's not a knowledge of techniques. It's about obedience. You can follow every motivator possible, every business guru you can imagine. But in the kingdom of God, it's about obedience. And so Holy Spirit says, ah, have a job. I have a job for you, boys. Have a job for you. That's all it is. So they extra, they fasted extra. You had to fast extra because Paul just a few years ago, I mean, Paul was crazy. He was killing people for God. Paul was a crazy guy. His name was Saul at that time, Saulus. God gave him name, changed his name from Saul to Paul, Paulus. Paulus means small or humble. And so this man and Barnabas, they decided that, okay, we're going to be obedient and we're going to go. And so they got dedicated and they went to do the work of God. Verse 3. So after more fasting and prayer, as I said, they laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed from the island for the island of Cyprus. Everybody say Cyprus. Okay. Island of Cyprus. There in the town of Salamis, okay, they went to Jewish synagogue and preached the word of God. Here we go. Little Johnny boy that grew up to be John Mark, Johannes Marcus, Johannes Hebrew, Marcus Greek. John Mark went with them as their assistant. This guy was so impressed with all the stories about disciples and what God was doing through them. He's like, hey, pick me, pick me, pick me. In fact, I encourage you, I would like to inspire you, as you if you're a parent, if you feel like your child is lost, not because they are disobedient or crazy, because they haven't discovered the calling of God upon their life. Sometimes you want to stop your kids from doing crazy things, being in the wrong time, in wrong places, but it's about knowing the calling. And discovering the purpose that God has for them. Let me say this one more time. Sometimes we react to their mistakes rather than say, hey, before you make mistakes, and trust me, you will, little kid. Let me just make sure that you understand an assignment God has placed upon your life. God has placed upon your life. And when you kids are submerged, submerged in God's presence, it's an old English term. But when the presence of God is a habitation, like it's the, not the visitation, it's the old terms. When it's like, this is my habit. This is place where God hangs out. It's my habit and this is his place. I just love to be with God. Rather than, oh yeah, one day a year I'll be like, like some great concert or maybe church or maybe meetings and they talk about God. I won't do it. You have to, you have to be Known for like, ah, oh, I just want to hang out with God. I just want to talk to God. And it's not that religious. It's not like being in a church where like people are falling and fire or God or whatever you think it is. It's more of a just, hey, let's just talk to God. Let's just talk to God. Just where you're at. So John was so inspired by that. He's like, hey, can I go with you? And in fact, if you know anything, the history, uh, Barnabas was related to John. Johnny Boy, his, uh, his uncle, believe, uh, theologians and scholars believe that Barnabas was his uncle. In fact, this was the same guy who 
sold a lot of his real estate and br brought the money and told the apostles in chapter 4. He says, hey, I have all this money. You know, give it to those that are in need. So the same man, the disciples called him a man of support, Barnabas. Now he says to Paul, let's do it. And Barnabas at that point, he was in charge. So Johnny Marr is going with them. He went to Cyprus. He went to Cyprus, the Greek area. Now he carries another name. He has a name, Marcus. He feels like he's not just a Jewish little boy. He can relate to people outside of his hometown. He could be anywhere in Europe. He's like, I'm one of your guys. I'm not anymore in Asia, in Jerusalem, in Syria. I'm going to Europe. I'm going to Cyprus. Okay? So he goes there, and I'm, I'm not going to read it, but if you continue in this chapter, they go to the first town, and, and they go to synagogue, and they preach. And so people are so impressed, they tell the governor, which, who was the king of the town, pretty big town, the port. And so the king says, bring Paul, bring Barnabas, and the little boy assistant. Bring them to my house, to my palace. So they come to his palace, and Paul the apostle, he's like, we only have one mission, sir, just to tell you about Jesus. And, and he just goes on and just preaches full gospel to this king who has never heard about Jesus. And, 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 and one thing you need to know about preaching the gospel is that if you want a lot of friends, you talk about God, but you have to be careful talking about Jesus. But if you want to know who are your true friends, you have to talk about Jesus. Because anytime you talk about God in general terms, religion, good things, vision, purpose, job, career, that's good. But the moment you go crazy, you go ballistic about Jesus, suddenly the devil is like he's creeping out from every hole possible. He's out there. And there's a guy named Eliam, and he comes out, this, this guy who was a sorceress, and he comes out, and he started just publicly in front of the king, just going against Paul and Barnabas. This guy was magician. He was demon-possessed. So he just tells the king, he's like, don't listen to these dudes. They're crazies. Don't listen to them. They're liars. This is just stupid philosophy. We're not going to follow. We are our own religion, our own culture. And Paul, <laughs> I love Paul. This guy, he was preaching full-on gospel. Okay? But when he saw this man go against him, he realized that he wasn't fighting a man. He was fighting a devil. And, and I know it's not a popular statement 21st century because we, we're cute. We're nice. We're like, uh, people just, they haven't embraced our philosophy yet. They, they don't know yet. We have to be nice to them. But when you preach full gospel, which means the message is about Jesus, it's just the truth is about black and white. I'm not talking about judging people. I'm talking about, hey, Jesus gave his life for you. See, anytime I have an opportunity to talk about Jesus, the moment I say Jesus died for you, I'm telling you, anytime I'm in any room, when, it, when, it's, when it's an unknown situation, people that I'm not really close with, but they allow me as a pastor to share a few words, the moment I say Jesus Christ gave his life for you, telling you those words or anything about Jesus, Jesus, purpose, life, death, life, Jesus, anything like that, it's like, whoa, people are uncomfortable. Just something happened. They start moving their bodies, their facial expression changes. It's like, ah, oh, it's just so uncomfortable. That's the truth. And the last few weeks, I've been in a situation like a few times. Okay? Can't share it because we're recording it. But Paul looks at him and he's like, you son of the devil. That's the term he uses, actually. You can read it. Okay? That's the term he uses. Just so don't blame me. Just read the scripture. Okay? He said, you son of the devil. He says, how long will you deviate people from understanding the truth? He says, you'll be blind for some time and you will not be able to see because God's punishment is upon you. Whoa, whoa. This is all in chapter 13. So if you want to take it out, good. But that's in the Bible. Okay? And so the guy became blind on the spot. So the king is like, what just happened? And Paul says, it's Jesus. He loves you. I'm here on a mission. I have a purpose. I was sent by God to tell you about Jesus. And king is like, I want, I want to follow that Jesus. Take this loser out of my palace. So he became Christian. That's what that, I'm telling you. Just read it. But here's a, here's a story about Johnny Boy. Here he, he sees it all. He's in Europe. He doesn't know the culture. He sees Paul going crazy. 
Paul going just full on gospel. He sees his uncle kind of rubbing Paul's shoulders because he's a nice guy. He's son of support, you know. And he sees soldiers with swords everywhere in the palace. He sees this demon possessed guy going crazy against them. He sees he's like, okay, we're gonna be killed right now. <laughs> What's gonna happen? And I was like, not me. I'm just a young dude. I travel with them. I'm here to take pictures. I mean, I have an Instagram account. I just want a cute, beautiful pictures of Cyprus Island. I, I like the water, the waves, and then uh, you know, Greece is a little bit further side. So, you know, Crete is right, right, right on the other side. Just leave me here. Okay, in fact, I was heading to Greece because there's more beautiful buildings and they're a little nicer, you know. I mean, why not? Mark and Karina were there, John and Tanya and a few other people, I, you know, Alex. And I mean, so I, I'm, I'm sure you went to Greece for pictures. Okay, so he's like, I'm just here for a few, for a few days. I mean, this is crazy. This is real. This is real. So the Bible says, the Bible says that after they done the work, He's like, Mom, I'm coming home. Like, what, son? Mom, this is real. These guys are crazies. Ah, Mom, you don't understand. I could have been dead by now. I'm ready to write a book. But beside the book, I'm done. I'm scared for my life. Going home, Mom. Going home. I'd rather sit on my couch, watch the TV, you know, get myself another movie, watch another game, and I'm done. I feel like I'm inspired. I don't want to be here. Let's go to another chapter. Come on, Marina, show us another scripture. Watch this. So Paul and his companions, which is Barnabas, Johnny, little Johnny boy, they grew up to be a young man. They left Paphos by ship to Pamphylia, landing in the port town Perga. Okay? What name do you like better? Paphos, Pamphylia, Perga. Let's vote. No, I'm joking. Don't waste your time. There, 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 John Mark left them. And return to Jerusalem. He just like, I'm done. I'm done. This is too much for me. I'm leaving. Everybody look at me. He left. For one and a half year, about 19 months, 18 to 19 months, he's home. I want you for a moment, put yourself in his shoes. Just listen to this. Because sometimes we read scripture, we're like, I know these stories, kind of heard the names. But put yourself in his shoes. You were with Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle. Anybody has a physical Bible, like book? Not the phone, not the app, app, the Bible. Anybody has like a physical book? Like you're still carrying book because you're like really, really, really man or woman of God. I like that. Thank you so much. Oh, this is amazing. This is the bigger the better. I love that. Thank you so much. Can I use this example? I'm John. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay. So this is called... The Bible, it's a study Bible, like this is profound, okay? And uh, New International, yes, and IV. Okay, and so half of this book is called New Testament. And half of New Testament of 27 books. Half of it was written by Paul, Paul the Apostle. So you were hanging out. You were witnessing the work, the ministry, and the power, the anointing of the guy who wrote half of New Testament. Think about it. You witness it. So people come to your house. You have a nice house. Your mom did well. Okay? She invites everybody. Dad is okay with that because mama's in charge as always, like in our house. And so, you know, you, you, so people would come to your house and they're like, dude, you heard anything from Paul, Barnabas, Peter, John, uh, Thomas is in India, uh, and just traveling if you Scotland and Ukraine. I mean, people were all over just if you study history, you know. It's like uh, people are all over. Nathaniel is in China. Like, do you, have you heard anything good? Imagine what you felt as a young dude. Did you turn your back on them? You left them. Imagine that every time they gather to hear the testimony and witnessing of the gospel, witnessing of people that were preaching the gospel, and you were in the midst of all of it. You saw it all. You went to other country. You went on a mission trip. You, you were there in the midst of all of it, but now you turn your back on them. Imagine, imagine what you felt about it. Can I love your pen? Okay. I'm Jackson, so okay. And... Imagine that for a moment. But here's a question I have for you. Because we're in the midst of the stories. We're talking about Johnny Boy. Johnny Boy's story. Okay? What is failure 
Is failure a person? Is failure a place? Or a failure is an event? What is a failure? Because if anything, if you left Paul and you left your uncle Barnabas, who were revered and respected by so many people, you left them, turn your back on them. You're home now and everybody's still going crazy about them. In fact, there's more stories about them. You left all of them. Imagine what you felt about it. 19 months being home in Jerusalem. You're used to the same road, same party, same friends, hanging out. It's boring because you've seen something powerful, different, amazing. It was true. It was authentic. It was profound. You saw that the king of another country and a place became a believer in an instant just like that because of the power of Jesus, because of the work of the Spirit of God. You saw it all, but now you came home. What is failure? I know you know this, but I have to remind you that when you make a mistake, you start questioning that maybe I'm a mistake. It wasn't just an event. It wasn't just a situation. Maybe I am a mistake. In fact, some of you probably heard in your life, some of you heard that somebody told you that you're a failure. Just heavy. I just felt like I didn't exercise enough, so. I have to give it back. No, thank you so much. Imagine that. And can I just tell you, look at me, everybody. When you make a mistake like that, or whatever a proportion that is, oftentimes it can define your life. Oftentimes you stay in prison by that one mistake. Why? Because you keep thinking about it. People remind you about that mistake. In fact, you, you, you would be labeled deserter. You left them. Turn your back on them. You were a lost child. You had that one chance. You blew it, man. Like, what would people label you? What would they call you? What would you be known for? It's hard. You might not relate to John as far as mission trip or whatnot. But what, what is it? That you thought that you were called to. That you were anointed for. What is it that you thought you have talent for? Gift for? What is it you tried? What is it that in the beginning you were inspired to do? That you had vision for? What is it that in the beginning you thought that you were in the midst of it? What is it that was happening in your life that life seems like, wow, you are in the midst of it. That you're living the dream. One mistake. One step. One decision. You're out. You're out. For 19 months, 19 months. What would have happened if John stayed there? If John just stayed with them and said, okay, we're done in one city, we're going to go to another city. In fact, many times, God does not want you to leave a place, location. He doesn't want you to leave the season you're in until you learn the lesson. He wants you to learn the lesson because if you don't learn a lesson, you change the location, but you're still the same person. You can leave too soon without learning and that is a mistake some of you are praying say God please change my life and then you kind of narrow it down you're like Lord just change my season I'm okay with that I kind of like myself but change my season you have to change my life I love the way I am I like myself but change my season and God says wait you don't want to hear the term wait you just say Change it now. I want a breakthrough. Open the door. Get me a window. I'm out. I want to be a bird that is out. I'm flying out of this. And God says, wait. I'm teaching you something. You have to learn something different, something new. Okay, so he's waiting. And then he decided to leave. So then let's go to chapter 15. Okay, here's a crazy passage. 
they travel, Paul and Barnabas travel quite a bit. John is excited now hearing all that. He understands that he might be a failure or, you know, he failed a Paul and Barnabas. So here's a chance. They're back in Jerusalem, back in his hometown. Perhaps theologians believe back in his house, in his house. And at that point, he comes to his uncle, Barnabas, and he says, Barnabas, you guys are going again to the mission trip, different countries? He's like, yes. He's like, um, can, I, can, I, can I go with you? Can I go with you? And his uncle is like, he looks into his eyes and he's like, Johnny, that was a mistake. But you know what? Yes, you can come with us. You can come with us. We're going to give you another chance. So he goes to Paul. At that, Paul, Paul, at that point, Paul was taking over because of the level of his anointing and, and, and the leader he became. So Paul says, no, absolutely not. He's not coming with us. And Barnabas says, what do you mean he's not coming with us? What do you mean? He's like, no, he's not coming. He says, but Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp. Watch this. That they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas. And as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Wow. I just want you to read backwards. Come on. Just be a little Jew here. Okay? I read backwards. Uh, Paul chose Silas. Verse 40. And as he left, the believers entrusted him. So now everybody, the attention is on Paul. The attention is on Paul. Paul is the big shot. He's so respected. He's so very respected that at that point, everybody's like, let's just pray for Paul. He's going with somebody else. It's almost like they are forgetting Barnabas. It's Barnabas that decided to take Mark. Everybody look at me. What is a bigger deal? What is more painful, when you fail yourself or when someone else fails you? Because John Mark failed himself and failed people in the first time. But now it is Paul, the author of the half of New Testament, that failed him. Think about his story. How would you like to be part of the story? See, Sometimes you cannot make decision what story you're a part of. But you can make decision what role you're playing in the story. Sometimes a story happens to you, events, things happen to you. Sometimes you just, it, it wasn't your choice. And so in the first place, it was Mark, John Mark that made decision to leave them. But the second place, the second event, this famous man, respected man, talented, gifted, legendary, Paul, says, absolutely, you're not coming with us. You failed us first time, you're out. Paul labeled Mark as a failure. And it is sad when you allow people to define who you are. It doesn't matter that he's Paul. Everybody make mistakes, including Paul. Everybody but Jesus. Everybody will make mistakes. If you think, I mean, some of you might be like, oh, this pastor failed me. Yep, I probably failed quite a few of you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I don't even know. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. But I'm sure I did. Paul did. He rejected him. How would you feel when you said, I want to go with you. I'm ready. I have the money. I raised the funds. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to commit my time, my effort. But this famous guy says, absolutely not. You already failed us. You're out. No more chances. How would you feel about that? How would you feel if your own parent, father, mama, maybe together, maybe a teacher, maybe a coach? How would you feel about that? It, incredibly, it just, it, it, it doesn't seem that big. But imagine this young Johnny, little Johnny, who grew up to be a young man. Who comes back to his uncle and he says, guys, I want to go with you. I, I want to go again. And Paul says, no. Paul rejected him. 
Barnabas says, okay, I'm going to take you with me. And guess what happens? He took him, he took Mark with him. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to this. Listen to this, everybody. Who wrote the very first book of the New Testament? Do you know that? Mark. The Gospel of Mark, out of 27 books of New Testament that you and I follow, Mark was the one that wrote the very first book. Think about it. History tells us that he established, he was presiding over 20 churches. In fact, watch what happened. This is the last few weeks of Paul's life. First, 2 Timothy chapter 4, watch this. He's writing out of prison. Paul is in prison. A few weeks later, he'll be beheaded. A few weeks after these words, and this is what he says. He says to Timothy, he says, only Dr. Luke is with me. Everybody left him. He's in Rome. He's in prison. He says, bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. Think about it. The same man that rejected Mark, Johnny, John Mark, the same man that rejected him, the same man realized, I shouldn't have. But more importantly, it's not what Paul did to John Mark. It's what John Mark believed. It's what John Mark perceived. It's what John Mark made a decision about. It's, a, it, it, it's he decided that, you know what, just because someone rejected me doesn't mean I'm out. So he went to hang out with his uncle. He grew up to be a phenomenal, incredible minister. A man that literally will shape the minds of thousands of people in the first century. In fact, when, when Paul died a few weeks after these words, when John died as a last disciple, it was Timothy and Mark that were leading the Christianity, the church as we know it. Think about it. I want to ask you today, what is your story like? What are the events in your life that you feel like you failed big time? You blew it. Huge mistake. Maybe it's a relationship issue. Just like him. Just like Johnny. Maybe it's a money issue. Maybe business. I want you to remember that failure is not a person, it's an event. You're not a failure. You're not, if you decide that you are not, you're not. Yes, you made a mistake, but that was an event. Who doesn't? Paul did. He made a mistake. Who doesn't? That's the truth. Who doesn't? If you would just allow Jesus, because I know we said it before, but let me just say one more time. Two of the closest to Jesus himself. Two of the closest. First, it was Judas who betrayed him. A few hours later, in the house of Hannah the priest, it was Peter that betrayed Jesus. Few of the closest in one night, they both betrayed Jesus. They both turned their back on Jesus. Guess what? One of them couldn't forgive himself. One of them decided that I am a failure and took his own life. Judas Iscariot. A Judas that we all hurt so much. We watch movie about him. We heard about him. We labeled people according to his name. But the only reason he took his life is because he has decided that he is a failure. The second guy was even worse than Judas. Because three times he says, I don't know Jesus. I don't know this guy. Just here to, you know, I'm just here to hang out. I'm just here so I don't get fined. I mean, just hanging out here. Guess what? He betrayed him three times. But he hanged long enough with Jesus. First guy hang himself. 
but this one hang long enough. And when Jesus came back, rose back from the dead, Jesus came back and he says, Peter, do you love me? Think about it. The way to get back, back on top of things in your life, the way to climb on a horse and ride the horse, the way to fight and conquer, the way to grow, the way to soar, has only one key, one principle, and that is allowing God to remind you about your calling. Because Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Well, how can I tell you that I love you if I just betrayed you? He says, okay. He says, yes. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. See, he reminds him about his calling. Ladies and gentlemen, this will hurt some people, but I'm just going to say this. If I hang out with you, and if I sit with you while, you are, while you're hurting, I'm a comforter. And some, sometimes we need that. We need to shut up and just sit there with you. But if I'm comforting you, it's good for the moment. Uh, thank you. You'll say thank you for your shoulder, John. I can cry on your shoulder. Thank you for being the pillow to me. I could just, just, you know, but you're comforter. But if I don't remind you about your purpose, you will never soar. Sometimes you are too long crying about your life. Sometimes you are stuck with your failures. You're stuck with your mistakes. Or maybe it wasn't even you. It just happened to you. And there's nothing you could have done. The truth is, Grieve if you need to. But the fastest way out of the situation is reminding yourself of the calling God has placed upon your life. Allowing God to tell you, hey, this is your purpose. Because that's what Jesus did. He didn't say, Peter, let's have a soft party right now. You betrayed me. I was killed. Look at my hands. Look at this. Wounds right here. You, you did it. Jesus says, you love me? Feed my sheep. Second time, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Third time, back into your purpose. Go back into your calling. 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 I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the only way that you will get out of your failures is standing in your calling. Standing in your anointing. Standing in your purpose. Going back in that lane and say, Lord, what do you have for me? I'm ready. I'm ready. I, I, I'm still hurt. I made a mistake. In fact, I'll, I'll be able to relate to people. Hey, I'm vulnerable. I, I, I'm more humble. Have you noticed that in the beginning, this is too much time, but have you noticed in the beginning Paul is Saul and then he is pa Paul? You know the difference between Saul and Paul? Paul means humble or small. That's the meaning of Greek word Paulos, Paul. In Greek, he is Paulos, the apostle. Yes. God says, hey, dude, just stay humble. You make mistakes like everybody else. Sup, man? You're not perfect. I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you to let God redefine your story. Because certainly John Mark's stories was just horrible. He fell big. People failed him. You name it. He could have had a pity party and could have committed suicide. He could have blamed everybody and himself. But he decided, you know what? I'm just going to trust Jesus. So this morning, I want to encourage you. Would you close your eyes for a moment? I want to encourage you right now. Just let God remind you remind you of that very calling it could have been a small call it could have been a small job it could have been a small mission it could have been just the presence of God people were gathering in John Mark's house he was a young man he heard all the stories and he kind of heard that God has called him maybe maybe just maybe he thought oh, I just want to join them but God liked that he loved the, the fact that John Mark wanted to try being with Paul and Barnabas. He wanted to go and help the people and tell them about Jesus. And at first he was full of fear. He wasn't, maybe even, he wasn't ready for it. But the fact that he was willing, 
The fact that he was available got God's attention. So God started working on him, changing him, molding him, shaping him, speaking to him. When he made a mistake, God says, hey, don't let Paul or anybody else define who you are. I love you. Go back into your calling. Go try it again. Go try it again. It's amazing what God will do through your life if you won't give up. And it's not about your strength. It's not about your ability. It's about who God is. Because if you stay in your failures, you're not saying to yourself, well, I'm not good enough. You're telling God. You're telling God, maybe, maybe just, maybe just maybe, God, you can't use me anymore. As if God is a failure. The truth is, God can do so many things through you. God can use you in such a mighty way. In fact, He can use you more after you've been broken. After you've been broken hearted. Because failures can break your heart, but it does not have to take away your calling. It doesn't have to break your will. It doesn't have to break your mind. It doesn't have to break your anointing. Because God is able. That's the truth. That's the truth. That's the truth. Come on. Would you just stand to your feet just for a moment, just for a moment. Just for a moment, just, I want you to talk to God for a moment. Talk to God for a moment.